I'm George Galloway, and I present Kale Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kale Mahorra means free words. That's what I speak. So Kale Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming to you from London, but talking about Turkey and its role in the Middle East. This is, of course, a vexed and movable subject, because if you were talking about the Turkey of Erdogan denouncing Shimon Peres at Davos and walking out, calling him a child killer, if you're talking about the Turkey that put together the Mavi Marmara siege-breaking ship to try and penetrate the Israeli cordon and bring much-needed, desperately-needed relief and aid to the Palestinians in Gaza, well, Turkey already had a growing influence in the Middle East. If you're talking about the Erdogan, the Turkey, which joined up, with a murderous gang of Westerners and Easterners to destroy their own next-door neighbor, Syria, then that's a different Erdogan and a different Turkey. If you're talking about the Erdogan who, with Davutoglu, embarked on a policy of no conflict with their neighbors, that was one Erdogan, one Turkey. If you're talking about the Turkey of just a few months ago at conflict with all of its neighbors and indeed back into an era of internal conflict, that's a quite different picture. The Turkish state and its former uh, uh, guise as an Ottoman Empire, of course, was the ruler of the Arab world. Some say that President Erdogan would quite like a return to those days with him as the sultan behind the sublime port. Others say, and I've just had a conversation uh, with uh, people from Somalia, that uh, the role of Turkey in Somalia is a good one. So, in other words, this is not a clear picture, neither is it a picture that's fixed at this moment in time, because it's not so long ago that the Islamic Republic of Iran, the Russian Federation, and Turkey got together for what was a vault fast, an about turn by the Turkish state in relation to the conflict in Syria. And as we speak, Turkish guns are booming in Syria against those who uh, have mustered there a Kurdish army of the YPG and other elements with American backing, with the clear intention of continuing a partial occupation of Syrian land and therefore the partition of the Syrian Arab Republic. I've gathered here an audience of distinguished experts and one or two enthusiastic amateurs just like me. On this subject, I know a fair bit Collectively, as an audience, we know a great deal more. Let's see how we get on. Who's got the microphone? Madam, you're welcome, and you are the first contributor. Thank you. Um, my name is Merva Kansel. I'm a research analyst on Turkey. Um, I would like to start with the ground operation that has just started on Syria um, that, is, or, that is conducted by Turkey. So Turkey... Um, rejected the formation of a 30,000 YPG border security force that was announced by the US and called it a terrorist um, army. So if we look at Turkey's policy, any Kurdish power that will be formed in the border alongside Turkey and Syria would be a national security threat to Turkey. That's how Erdogan uh, defines it and they, they, Erdogan calls it a terror nest. Uh, and it, he will destroy them. It doesn't matter what the cost will be. Um, however, uh, we cannot um, 
analyze Turkey's Middle East, in particular uh, Syrian border policy, without looking at Turkey's internal situation at the moment. There will be elections made in 2019, and there are main factors that play an important role in Turkey's Middle East policy. Uh, first of all, first of it would be the economy that is being turning in worse since 2019 in Turkey, and the human rights issues that is going on in Turkey at the moment. Um, many journalists being imprisoned and um, people have been dismissed uh, by their official um, servant uh, services, uh, allegedly being linked to Gulenist movements and freedom of speech being deteriorating and many people have been victimized by this allegedly Gulenist uh, link. And also the Kurdish issue have still um, been remaining unsolved. This is very important. So any Kurdish um, existence in the border with Syria will be called a national security threat by Erdogan, and he will he will do whatever um, it takes whatever it takes to um, r remove this any Kurdish f uh, force in the in the border. So YPG is one of the biggest power there at the moment. YPG was supported uh, by the U.S. and also adv advised and armed by the U.S. and NATO allies in order to fight against ISIS, which has been a success so far. And um, Turkey just doesn't um, seem to accept that and embrace YPG, uh, which, is, which is natural because um, the, it sees it as a terrorist organization along with PKK in Turkey at the moment. And PKK is the um, f Kurdish force that has been fighting for autonomous region in Turkey. And the war against PKK has been ongoing over three decades now. Um, naturally, any link, um, any Kurdish force that would be called a national uh, security threat by Erdogan. So I think um, Turkey needs to solve its internal politics and um, maybe not um, involve in serious problems at the moment. Um, but this is not what is being done because Kurdish existence in the border will be a threat to Erdogan. Um, maybe any possible uh, autonomous region and the linkage of Afrin with other uh, self-declared autonomous Kobani, Rojava and Man Manbij region. It will be called a security threat and Turkey will do whatever it takes to be there and be in the game and have a say there along with um, other um, key actors like Russia and Syria. Well, that's a masterful uh, summary of the current situation, which is riven with contradictions and paradoxes. The only reason why there is a YPG armed presence in Syria is because President Erdogan effectively launched a war against the Syrian Arab Republic and tried to destroy it. Indeed, predicted almost weekly that President Assad would fall next week, next week, next week, and six years have gone by. Hundreds of thousands of people have been killed. Uh, millions have been driven out as refugees or internally displaced. And President Erdogan was one of the main causes of this carnage. And now he's gone to war with the YPG to deal with one of the symptoms of the policy that he followed. Secondly, as you put it, the United States is backing the YPG. It has to, because it has no men on the ground itself, not at least in measurable numbers, not that would survive for five minutes if in a straight fight with Syria and its allies. So the YPG is now effectively an auxiliary of the United States. President Erdogan is a member of NATO. The United States is the leader of NATO. Now they are effectively fighting each other. The Turkish armed forces fighting a surrogate or auxiliary of the United States. What are going to be the implications of that? And if President Erdogan succeeds in crushing the incipient autonomous Kurdish power in the north of Syria, what will he do then? Will he support the return of these areas to the Syrian Arab Republic? Or will he kiss and make up with the United States 
and find some other solution, perhaps involving Turkish occupation uh, of northern Syria. Uh, these are only three of the paradoxes. There are many more. The Erdogan who started and was the only man in Turkey who could have started the admirable policy of a peace process inside Turkey to end the decades of civil war inside Turkey and solve the Kurdish question on the basis of negotiation and politics rather than treating it as a criminal or anti-terrorist fight. If he had not abandoned that policy and returned to war with the Kurdish people, then we wouldn't be in the situation that we're currently in. So what's your uh, observation on these contradictions uh, and how they're going to be worked through? So when we talk about NATO and Turkey being a member of NATO and what's going to happen, um, it's uh, it's evident that Turkey doesn't agree with U.S. and its policies uh, with supporting YPG. On the other side, when we look at the um, ground operation in Afrin, America has no existence in Afrin, but Russia does. So the airspace was controlled by Russia. But Russia has now left. Yeah, Rus Russia has now left, and um, Turkey is on the ground, and the things have been going on, and the bombs are, have been dropping all over the city. Um, we can't really see what will be happening because his policies uh, are a little bit um, unpredictable at the moment. He, he, the rhetoric that he uses is, um, it seems that he has no rules and he has no, um, he doesn't know anything, but he just wants to go there and uh, remove the existence of YPG. This is very determined. Uh, policy that he has. Um, that would not be an easy fight, by the way. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, we have seen that YPG has been very, uh, has been getting very powerful and they have, they have been successful pushing ISIS even out of the area. Um, we will see how this will turn out. However, um, I think Tur Erdogan's main calculations are related with the upcoming elections. Um, I think the rhetoric that he uses, nationalistic rhetoric that he uses here, we have to, we cannot uh, ignore this. This is very important because he wants to gain he's the majority. He's a nationalist uh, here. Uh, he's an Islamist there. Uh, <laughs> it's a very uh, movable. It could be piece. a little bit of, I mean, it's politics. And uh, when you look from that perspective, it could be understandable. But um, you should look at the consequences of one leader's policies. You see that in the southeastern Turkey, especially in provinces like Diyarbakir, Sur and Shirnak, which was under siege, there was humanitarian issues. Um, opposition leaders have been, have been silenced, such as uh, Selatin Demirtas, the leader of the main, uh, one of the main opposition parties, HDP, uh, People's Democratic Party. He, he, is, he remains in jail at the moment and he could have been an alternative leader. Um, He's still uh, imprisoned without uh, knowing what what the um, case is about. So all these opposition si voices have been silenced, and there's Gulenist uh, movement going on and the uh, uh, interrogations about that. People being victimized. Um, people losing their right to travel, their passports have been cancelled, they have been labelled as Gulenists, and many people have lost their jobs, their lives have changed dramatically. So you have to see this internal um, domestic factors that are beyond his policies. The nationalistic rhetoric has always been uh, bringing success to leaders in Turkey. If you use nationalistic rhetoric, it's uh, more likely you're going to get the, the most out of the ballot box in the elections. And for sure he wants to uh, gain the majority of the votes in 2019 because he even conducted a major referendum a couple of years ago where he, where he plans to become the president and gain the majority of the power. So I think we cannot ignore these factors beyond, um, behind the policies of Erdogan in the Middle East. Syrian border is very important. If there is a linkage between auto, uh, autonomous areas, Kurdish areas, that this could potentially mean that Kurdish powers are becoming more strong and they are, they are more likely to build an autonomous Kurdish state maybe in that area. And Erdogan doesn't want the same thing to happen 
inside Turkey, especially in the southeastern Turkey. That's why um, Syrian border is very important, and we will see how this Afrin operation will end. Uh, well, it's very you. hard to say something at thank the moment. Thank you very much thank indeed you. for that uh, introduction. Who'd like to come in next? Yes, Doctor. My name is Dr. Marcus Papadopoulos, and I'm the editor of Politics First magazine. I think um, it's very evident that Turkey's influence in the Middle East is growing, uh, but at the same time its influence in the South Caucasus is growing, in the Eastern Mediterranean it's growing, in North Africa it's growing, and in East Africa it's growing. And we really need to put this um, uh, into a framework. Why is Turkey able to do what it is doing at the moment in Syria? And it's down to the strategic partnership between America and Turkey, which is one of the closest, which is one of the most formidable of its kind in the world. Now, there's a lot of talk at the moment, even from some commentators, that Turkey's relationship with America um, could become ruptured. Well, quite frankly, these people are either ignorant or they're just living in cloud cuckoo land because the benefits accruing from Ankara because of its strategic relationship with America are absolutely massive. Turkey has been allowed to invade northern Syria because of its relationship with America. It has been allowed to invade northern Iraq because of, because of its relationship with America. And while Erdogan uh, in public talks about uh, Turkey, the need for Turkey to be uh, an independent country and not told what to do by anyone, of course he's not an idiot. He will, be saying, he will be saying things very differently in private and Erdogan and indeed no Turkish leader whatsoever will jeopardize uh, Turkey's relationship with America because Turkey has a blank check from America. And we also need to ask, what is the foundation for Turkey's expansive and aggressive role in the region? And it really does, in my opinion, come down to what happened in 1974. Because in the summer of 1974, Turkey invaded Cyprus illegally. It partitioned it. It created 200,000 Greek Cypriot refugees. And ever since then, Turkey has been, in effect, ruling the north of Cyprus illegally, but they get away with that because of its relationship with America. Now, turning to its, uh, its, its policy in regard to Syria, yes, the Turks are present at the moment in the north, but I don't believe their presence, their influence, is going to be long-term because the Russians are very clear about their relationship with Turkey. Russia and Turkey historically um, have a problematic relationship. There is mutual distrust and hostility on both sides. But Russia has to work with Turkey. Turkey is a neighbour. But I think that the Turks understand that their overall objective of trying to overthrow the Syrian government has failed. And that sooner or later, most of the territory, if not all of the territory in Syria, will come under the jurisdiction once again um, of Damascus. So I think it, it is very important to understand that Turkey is able to do what it wants uh, in Iraq, in Syria, because of that relationship with America. More of this after the break. You're watching Kalima Horra with me, George Galloway, for Al Maidin Television here in London, discussing Turkey and its role in the Middle East. Is the Turkish role becoming bigger and stronger, or is Turkey just too divided? We took the Kalima Horra camera onto the streets of London earlier to see what the people thought. Take a look at this. Erdogan's policies are good for Turkey. Dictatorship is uh, going on in Turkey right now. No, not at all. Oh, I don't know. Aslında biz çok fazla Erdoğan'ın politikalarını 
doğru bulmuyoruz. Çünkü Erdoğan'ın politikaları çok e, halkçı ve demokratik politikalar değil. E, ve Kürtler bugün e, Orta Doğu'da kendi topraklarında kendi hakları için savaşıyorlar. Ama Erdoğan ve hükümeti e, tamamıyla e, insanın en doğal hakkı olan e, kimlik hakkı, kültür hakkı, dil hakkını e, Kürtlerin elinden alıyor. Do you think that Erdogan's policies are good for Turkey? I don't think so. Um, from what I heard is that he interferes in um, Syria and he buys uh, oil from ISIS and uh, therefore he has sustained ISIS and he is um, complicit like Britain and America in uh, millions of people losing lives in Syria and uh, and being refugees all over the world. I don't know too much about the Turkish policies, but I imagine he doesn't just because there's been a lot of um, unrest there recently. So I'm going to go with probably not. Um, no. Well, some good common sense there from the uh, good old British public. Uh, Dr. Marcus, of course, the United States and Turkey, long before Erdogan, going back uh, decades, as you've just said, have a strategic relationship. Uh, and Turkey has been a member of NATO for half a century or more. Uh, and Russia has a tactical uh, relationship with Turkey. That's why the Turkish forces have just left the north of Syria, so that the Turkish armed forces can crush the YPG. Uh, so some have a strategic relationship, some have a tactical uh, relationship. But there are contradictions which you didn't deal with, if I may say so. Uh, you say that Turkey is present now in Syria because America allows them, but America is backing the other side that they're fighting. The YPG are using American weapons, uh, they have American logistical support, and it's a moot point if they're about to be crushed, there may be uh, more severe uh, sanctions by the United States to try and at least maintain some kind of balance uh, in the region. You mentioned East Africa. Turkey is uh, heavily involved in, for example, Somalia. But it's in Somalia in hostility to, in contradiction to, other key U.S. allies. So its purpose in Somalia is to effectively by proxy fight Saudi Arabia, fight the UAE. Again, the US is on, in this case, in your scenario, both sides then. It's backing Turkey, but it's also backing the people trying to kill Turkey. When 500 people were blown up in a single terrorist attack in Mogadishu, the actual target of that terrorist attack was the Turkish military base there. And it was almost certainly paid for and uh, made possible by Gulf friends of the uh, of the United States. So I don't see it quite as clear cut as you. And of course, you mentioned, Madam, the Gulenist uh, threat, one of many threats uh, to Erdogan's power in Turkey. Gulen is sitting in in uh, in Virginia, uh, uh, I think, twelve minutes from the from the the CIA. Uh, Gulen is in the United States. So if there's a Gulenist threat to the, to the Turkish state, the United States must be involved in it, or they would arrest him, or they would return him to Turkey for trial. So I don't think the relationship between the US and Erdogan is quite as clear-cut as you say. Well, I think as with any relationship, um, no matter how loving that relationship, no, no matter how close that relationship is, naturally there's always going to be problems, there's always going to be tension and there's no question about at the moment that on the one hand in Syria the Turks and the Americans are on the same page as each other in that they try to overthrow the Syrian government. Yes. On the other hand there is tension regarding the American support uh, for the Kurds but this issue will pass and you know Turkey will always think in the long term, and I, uh, Turkey is here for, the, for, for, for indefinitely, Erdogan is not. The Turkish elite, no matter how monstrous, no matter how malignant they actually are, they're very intelligent and they always think 
long term and they know that if anything was to jeopardize its relationship with America then Turkey's position would be seriously in trouble let us not forget the Americans have nuclear warheads on Turkish territory they that do. is the ultimate protection so if the Turks ever try to go too far with the Americans the Americans could just warn them <coughs> we withdraw those nuclear warheads and then what one of our distinguished experts who joins us is uh, defense and security analyst and uh, the doyen of such analysts, if I may say so, Charles Shoebridge. Charles, let's deal with the military situation first, may we? Um, this action has begun. I believe, you may disagree, that it will not be easily won and that whilst Erdogan has clearly secured tactical agreement with Russia uh, to mount this operation, there's no evidence I've seen uh, that uh, suggests the United States has agreed to it. Uh, quite the contrary. And therefore, uh, Erdogan is now at war, as we speak, with an American auxiliary army. What could possibly go wrong? Tell us. Yes, that's exactly right. I mean, we've seen, uh, we've got quite a lot of uh, recent record to go on to judge the situation from in respect of this. If we look at uh, Euphrates sh uh, Shield, the operation that uh, Turkey mounted some time ago with declared very similar aims to those now. In other words, to, I mean, at the time, of course, op openly they declared them uh, the aims to be to go against ISIS. Uh, but uh, very quickly, uh, for those that it wasn't clear to right from the start, it was actually more of an operation against uh, the Kurdish forces, actually, that were fighting ISIS, in the, especially in the north of Syria. Um, and in that operation, uh, over a long period of time, the Turkish forces suffered greatly at the hands of uh, the YPG forces that they were fighting and uh, YPG have shown themselves uh, an effective fighting force. Furthermore, they have been equipped uh, with quite sophisticated weaponry uh, by not just the United States, even the United Kingdom and others have supplied the Kurds with uh, weaponry and uh, of course praised them uh, openly and widely for their role in fighting ISIS. Um, I've always called the Kurds in Syria uh, US uh, proxies, whether wittingly or otherwise. But the Turks have got themselves into a difficult position uh, by largely Erdogan's own policies. I think that's fairly well established. It's almost a consensus now, no matter what one's opinion of the position is. They, uh, at the very least, turned a blind eye, the Turks, to the activities of ISIS, Al-Qaeda and other Islamist rebels because they were effectively fighting uh, Assad. They were effectively almost a proxy for Turkey. And we all know Indeed, the lady even on the streets of London there referred to the fact that for a long time, perhaps not now, but for a long time, we turned a blind eye in the West, America particularly, to Turkey, especially dealing uh, with ISIS oil. Of course, um, then when uh, ISIS, if you like, came off the, off the leash, they started acting independently. They weren't for now uh, eventually serving US, Turkish uh, interests. Uh, then, of course, they, as again, many of us predicted, Dr. Marcus, myself, we all, yourself, all predicted this would happen. And, of course, ISIS then turned on the hands that were feeding them. And therefore, of course, Turkey did belatedly take action against ISIS. But they really used it as an opportunity to then strike what they called equal terrorists, which are the Kurds. Now, the problem is for Turkey, and we have to acknowledge this, I think, is that actually they have created a genuine security threat for themselves by their actions in promoting instability in Syria. One could look at it five, six years ago and go, what on earth was Turkey doing promoting instability on its borders in such a volatile region, particularly given long-term Kurdish aspirations and capabilities? And indeed, going back to what the, the lady said earlier, in terms of the threat that that formed on the big strategic uh, level of a Kurdish unification, a Kurdish unified state. Isn't, isn't, uh, I'll let you come back in, of course. Uh, yeah. Isn't it that the... As George Bush would put it, they misunderestimated the strength of the uh, Syrian regime. They, uh, when they were making these wild, ludicrous uh, uh, predictions, that uh, they were even putting dates on it, that Assad will be gone by next week, the week after, six weeks, and so on. They uh, misunderestimated the potential of President Assad and his state and the Syrian Arab Republic to defeat this ISIS, Al-Qaeda, alphabet soup uh, invasion. Uh, and therefore, he's not that clever. I mean, Dr. Marcus thinks that they're fiendishly clever, but this is an example, isn't it, of how stupid they were. 
Well, they, they miscalculated, absolutely. But it, it's interesting that they were actually making those calculations. When we say we, we mean Erdogan and his elite in Turkey, because they didn't uh, declare opposition to Assad immediately. They declared opposition to Assad when it really did look like he'd got 10 minutes to go, as all of our think tanks and so-called experts in the West's media were saying, of course, without saying usually that they were funded by some of the parties actually involved in this conflict. And therefore, of course, it would encourage the rebellion uh, to say those things. But, um, of course, it's also created this situation. I mean, I, I'll very quickly say it's analogous in a way to the Israeli situation with the Golan Heights and elsewhere, where they encouraged a situation of uh, destabilizing their uh, enemy, Assad, Syria. Um, but, of course, it's now uh, creating a situation of instability on their borders, notwithstanding the assistance that Israel has given groups such as uh, al-Qaeda-linked uh, 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 rebel group groupings um, and of course that means now that there is a, a threat growing to Israel from those Islamist groups that they have done their best to feed over the last few years and that is the same position that Turkey is now in and so we can see from Turkey's perspective why they see now not necessarily an ex existential threat but a serious threat from the Kurdish uh, uh, military that they themselves have empowered by their destabilization of Syria, along with the massive refugee problem and, of course, the hundreds of thousands of deaths that that rebellion has caused. Another paradox I'd like your view on. Um, it's undoubtedly true that the Kurdish forces in Syria have been acting as proxies for the US. But you use the phrase wittingly, unwittingly. This is a paradox because these YPG people are communists and Trotskyists and even anarchists and yet they're acting as a, an auxiliary for the United States. They must know that. They're too clever not to know it. You've got a situation where the Kurds were in a desperate situation. The Kurds are going to take assistance from wherever they can get it, um, especially when it was in terms of military support. And uh, America's relationship with rebel groups and insurgencies and indeed dictatorships around the world is directed only towards its own interests. And people understand that. Um, other countries are the same. So this isn't necessarily an attack on the United States. But what we've seen over the last few years, and it's been continued with this government under Trump, is a, a US policy in the Middle East which has been incoherent, it's been incompetent, and it's been above all, and this is seen, I think, not just by the Kurds, but also by Turkey, it's been duplicitous. It's been deceitful. We've back, they've backed one party against another, then they've pulled out and, and backed another. And I would say that Turkey's position is far stronger than, with respect, uh, Dr. Marcus suggests, because I see Turkey as a player in a great game, as it always has been, but in this case, it is able to play off Russia and America against each other. They both desperately want Turkey to be an ally of theirs. And you've got Russia and Turkey becoming ever closer, despite their differences, but they've also got a great deal of economic, um, uh, uh, for example, economic cooperation is strong between them. So they've got a lot of motivation to work together. And yet this is a very powerful, strong NATO member. Yes. Now, uh, Tillerson, in complete contradiction to his earlier protestations, has now said that the United States intends to stay in Syria. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, they obviously have forgotten what happened to the US Marines in Beirut. I have publicly predicted exactly the same thing will happen to the United States if they stay in Syria. Uh, do they mean it, do you think? Does the Trump administration, can it be relied on in anything that it says? And if they mean it, what will be the attitude, for example, of Russia to that? Russia has committed itself over and over again to, uh, if anything, it's to Syrian uh, national sovereignty and in, uh, the integrity of, of Syria as a nation state. Um, American policy has, uh, I think it's accepted even in the American establishment, that it's been a failure for them in the Middle East in terms of uh, empowering Iran, empowering Russia. Um, and now you've got the situation where, as I mentioned earlier, Turkey is in the middle. It can play off one against the other. As for the forces that are in Syria, those forces are only 2,000 strong. Yes, they have air support. But at some point, um, uh, those 2,000 people there, mostly special forces and uh, air crew, uh, so in other words, not regular infantry, they're not going to be able to hold any ground by themselves. Also, um, Syrian and Iraqi forces have already joined up on the border. So to a large degree, the aim of America, I would have argued, in going into that part of Syria in the first place, which was to prevent this so-called arc 
between Lebanon, if you like, Syria, Iraq, this so-called Shia crescent, it's probably already failed anyway. So now people can argue they should stay there because of the oil fields, uh, the Derezo oil fields and so on, which America through its proxies still controls. But if Turkey is permitted, as it is being, to hammer the Kurds in this way, and if this continues for a long time, then it may be that their Kurdish proxies will turn on Indeed. Americans themselves. There'll be no, and no so, proxies. And so I feel, I feel their position there is extremely precarious. And again, I expect American policy in respect to this is going to waver one way or the other, and we'll see what happens. We will indeed, and there'll be more after this. You're watching Kali Mahora with me, George Galloway, for Al Maidin Television, coming from London, talking, though, about the Middle East and, in particular, Turkey's role, its actual role or the role that it would like to play. Is Turkey moving up or moving back? Anyway, we took the camera onto the streets of London, as I said earlier, to hear what the people thought. Let's have a look. What do you think of Turkey's role in the Syrian war? Uh, I don't know. I've, I've no opinion on that. Hmm. Um, to be honest, I don't know. I'd be interested in finding out more, but I don't have a clue. Um, obviously, I'm not a politician, but as much as I follow the news, I think that, um, that uh, a lot of what has happened in Syria right now uh, is uh, because of the greed and the fact that he just wanted the oil at a good price and now he's getting from, from the biggest terrorists in the world, ISIS. He's getting his cut and, he's, and then he's selling it off to Europe. Yeah, good for Erdogan, but yeah, but, but millions of people have lo lo lost their lives, yeah. Turkey's role in Syria is more Kurds bir savaştır. Kürtlerin kendi dilini, kimliğini, kültürünü ve ülkesinin olmasını istemiyor. Çünkü Kürtlerin kendi e, sistemini, alternatif sistemi olan demokratik ulusu orada yaratmak demek Erdoğan rejiminin tamamen ortadan kaybolması. Do you think that the Turkish president is wrong for opposing a Kurdish state? Yeah, I think that it's high time for the freedom of Kurdistan. And um, and uh, I think the the culturally and uh, in terms of the free like in terms of the freedoms of the Kurdish people to use their language and to express their culture, I think loads of um, progress has been made, and I think it's it's high time for them to have their own uh, uh, state. I do understand that Kurds want independence. I do understand that, um, and I do know that they had it before Churchill segregated them. However, I don't know if that is sustainable and, and how that would work because they would have to separate themselves from Syria, Iran, Turkey. So I don't know. I know that they're amazing people. I know that they're courageous. I know that they deserve the best. But whether that independence will make them better off or no, I don't know. Well, some interesting views on the streets of London. Let's get even more interesting views from our enthusiastic amateurs and our distinguished experts, one of whom is you, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, my name is Abdullah Hawes. I'm a journalist. Um, so I think most of the discussion has been on Turkey and its role in Syria, which um, before going to this, I just want to make a note about Syria and uh, all the talk, I mean, has been surrounding on the role of foreign powers in Syria, as if the whole problem in Syria is because of Turkey and others, which is not the case, I think. What happened in Syria is there was a revolution at the beginning. There were a lot of demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations by people against Assad, and it was crushed by the regime. And we have seen, for example, in Hama, more than... 100,000 people poured to the streets against uh, Assad and then suddenly a lot of people got killed and then a lot of obviously uh, foreign powers including Turkey intervened but it wasn't only Turkey we have Iran we have Russia we have uh, US and of course there's the, this argument that this intervention by let's say Iran and Russia may be legitimate because Assad wanted that because he's the 
legitimate power in Syria. But I don't think this is the case. There has been a revolution in Syria like elsewhere in the Arab world. We had Arab Spring. Where else? We had in Tunisia, we had in Egypt, we had, we had in Yemen. How did they go? Well, I'm, well I don't talk about the aftermath. Of course, there are a lot of problems. We can discuss that. But you cannot say what happened in Syria. It was all a conspiracy. No, I'd be powers. the last person to uh, say that. But, uh, uh, but of but, course... But yours is a rather sanitized uh, version. Uh, we should oh. place aside Iran and Russia because they were, as you yourself acknowledged, invited to defend Syria from an influx of 100,000 or more foreign fighters armed and paid by other foreign countries. See, the, th the thing in Syria, uh, of course we talk about uh, Turkey, but I, I, I think it's important to make this point. What happened in Syria, it wasn't like this at the beginning. We have seen, I think you have seen a lot of videos, credible videos, that at the beginning it was peaceful demonstrations. It started in Dar'a and then in Hama, Homos, elsewhere. Yeah, in the first it was, weeks, yeah. It was like this at the beginning, mm -hmm. but then it was Assad who turned against these people, and then there are credible research that Assad contributed actually to uh, releasing a lot of extremist people who obviously turned against them, mm. and then turned the way it is. I'm not saying it's all good. There are a lot of problems. A lot of jihadist people right now infiltrated to the revolution and it became very nasty, but it wasn't the case at the beginning. Right now, we have a problem in Syria. It should be solved and it should not be solved by giving all the power to Assad. There are other powers they should be given. Uh, well, other countries? No, no, not other countries. There are people inside uh. Syria. I have been in Syria in August mm. uh, in the Kurdish part. I'm glad uh, you managed to escape as a as a journalist? Uh, well, I'm not Syrian myself. I'm Iraqi Kurd, but I went for a research to the yeah. Syrian Kurdistan. No, it's just that they eat the hearts of journalists and cut their heads off. Oh, uh, yeah, they do. These, uh, but uh, I didn't the, go these to these revolutionaries the <laughs> that you. I didn't go so there. Uh, I, I, I only managed to go to the Kurdish uh, region uh, for a research. But, for example, the Kurds, they don't want asset and they are 10% of their population. They want at least their own autonomy. Do you want to deprive them of their own right? Mm -mm. No. There are other people as well. Of course, there are asset supporters as well, but it's not 99% of the population. There are other people. There should be a way, I, I, I mean, there should be a way to manage to, to make Syria. I'm not saying you should partition it. Probably it's not the best thing in the Middle East right now. We have a lot of problems, but there should be a way out because what, elections are not the best yes, thing. Yes, yes. No, no doubt. So, so, so you're, you're Kurdish. Yeah. Uh, the Kurdish forces in Syria have allied with the United States, which has just announced that it intends to stay and partition right. Syria. That's what partition means. If a foreign country, the United States, intends to stay against the wishes of the Syrian state in Syria, that's partition. And your comrades are collaborating uh, with that. That's not likely to lead to much Syrian introspection on on uh, what your legitimate demands are, is it? Uh, it's, U.S. said they are going to stay as much as it's needed. This is what exactly Tillerson and uh, well, I know exactly other, what he said. I, others I, said. I the so the, the thing times. is, what you have in Syria right now, there are, you have Geneva talks and you have sushi talks. There should be a settlement. This is the, the case. And Kurds th see it this way as well, by the way. They are not saying we want to partition our part, but they want autonomy and it's their right. And I don't think U.S. actually... It's actually the right. I mean, I support it, but it isn't actually the right. The Syrian constitution has no such right. Well, the, they don't... There's no such right in the Syrian constitution see, for an autonomous see the, the, Syrian the, the, area. The thing is... You area no, the, the thing is you talk about Syria as if they have a constitution and we should respect it. It's not like this, okay? Mm. You don't have... I'm not saying only in Syria, in a lot of places in the Middle East, including Turkey, by the way, after the, the referendum that they had for... Uh, switching to presidency. I don't think... Well, Iraq, I mean, in uh, Iraq as well. The, the Iraqi same, Kurds declared the, the, an independent state. Just which which was, by the way, it was unconstitutional and I personally was ah, against it. Okay. Back to constitutions. In, in Iraq, it's, it's different. There, there has been a vote for it, a democratic vote. For example, Sunnis reject. It was obvious, okay? In Syria, this is not the case. A lot of people don't acknowledge this constitution, which was written by a parliament, which is fully controlled by Assad uh, men, okay? 
In Syria, the thing that you have right now is the, there are talks, there should be a settlement. I'm not saying there should be partition, but there should be a way that other people should also breathe. There, there is, for example, this report by Freedom House. Syria, you know how much it scored? Minus one. Minus one. It's mm. even worse than mm. the worst it's in the It's a very uh, respectable uh, source, Freedom no, but, House, I but, must say. But you have free, no. The clues in the name. Okay, you know what? You go to Damascus and be against Assad. What would happen? Uh, well, well it, I don't think it would uh, go, it, go very well. That's true, so this is course. freedom. That's even truer in countries like Saudi Arabia and exactly, of the course, uh, Emirates. Yeah, who that's, are that's giving true. your friends money and weapons. Not only, not only Saudi Arabia and even in Turkey. For in Turkey, there are a lot of myself. I cannot go to, to Turkey right now. I have a lot of problems there. So it's not only Syria, but I'm saying in Syria as well. Well, look, let's... Let, let's uh, but, uh, uh, but I want to have a comment about Turkey itself, which is the That's what I was point. about to ask you about, so go ahead. Yeah, um, I think it, Turkey's foreign policy is not only driven by local politics. Well, it is part of it, I think. But I think there's a mixture of ideology, of local politics, and Erdogan himself. So there are three different dimensions, I think. So ideologically, of course, uh, we know that uh, AKP or Erdogan's party is uh, Islamist, and they have this uh, Ottomanist uh, vision for the Middle East. And I think that was best um, envisioned by Ahmed Daudoglu, who has this uh, in-depth foreign policy uh, vision, which was not very successful, obviously, we have seen. But uh, I think that that's part of their vision of this Ottomanist way of looking at the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And then you have Erdogan himself, who I think has a kind of different view of how things should be, which is partially driven by his own, um, by his own uh, ambitions. For example, uh, one good example for this would be Iraqi Kurds. So for Iraqi Kurds, uh, it was all started because of the oil in the Kurdish part, which Erdogan has collaborated with the Barzani family in, in northern Iraq to export their oil uh, against the will of the Iraqi uh, government. Uh, I think it was even unconstitutional to do that. But Erdogan did it because they have a lot of business. His family, uh, his son-in-law, Al-Bayrak, has a lot of business w with Kurds. Mm -hmm. So he has... This is also part of his... It was sold by Turkey to Israel, of course. To Israel and to other people as well. So partially, I don't think this is what, let's say, the wider AKP or uh, his ruling party may want. But Erdogan, this is part of his... For, this is part... So part of his foreign policy is driven by his personal ambitions, not only... So you also have, as I said, this Ottomanist uh, AKP... Uh, vision, and then you have local politics, as she said, for example, their alliance with the nationalist Mahape and uh, all the uh, the Kurdish problem as well, of course. So uh, when it comes to the Middle East, especially Syria and uh, let's say Iraq, Iran and elsewhere, of course, uh, these are all parts that will give you a bigger picture on how Turkey is acting in mm each of these uh, countries. I, I, I touched on this earlier, but I'd like your uh, brief comment on it. It seems to me that uh, the Turkish state cannot possibly be successfully expansive. It cannot possibly increase its regional uh, or pan-Islamic purchase when it is itself entirely divided and fractured in, existentially, uh, in existential ways. It's not just that the Turkish state is now at war with 20% of its own population. Uh, it's not just that journalists, professors, anyone who breathes uh, a contrary view uh, gets locked up. It's the fracture along the Gulenist uh, AKP split, the fractures uh, between... AKP and, if you like, bourgeois liberal uh, layers in Turkey that exist. It's the conflict with all of the neighborhood. Uh, how can you have all these problems and yet hope to be a major world player? Well, yeah, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, unless uh, Turkey would meant its uh, own wants inside Turkey, I don't think they can be uh, successful outside their borders. I mean... Um, they already had 
the Kurdish problem. Now they added Gulen's problem. They have added problem. Even I think they are uh, opening another front with the uh, other Kemalist opposition. So they have, I think, as you said, I mean, I think partially Erdogan is playing this uh, divisive role because it's 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 feeding his own uh, voter base, voting base. But I don't think if Erdogan really cares about Turkey itself, he can he can manage to become as expansive or as ambitious as he wants unless he can unify the country itself. I mean, I think the, the biggest among these problems is the Kurdish problem, which uh, because you have a very big Kurdish population in Turkey and without solving this problem, because it's a, a problem whether, uh, I mean, he has acknowledged at the beginning of his rule, by the way, but mm. then he, you know, <laughs> retreated from his own statements. Uh, without solving these problems, I don't think uh, he would, uh, his uh, expansion dream would become um, successful. I mean, uh, it's not only it won't become successful, I think it would even lead to more problems inside Turkey, yeah. uh, even maybe partitioning the yeah, country in the could, longer run. It could lead to yeah. collapse. There'll be much more after the break. You're watching Kali Mahora with me, George Galloway, for Al Maidin Television in London, talking Turkey and the Middle East and its role in the world. Yes, sir, you have the microphone. Please give us your observations. Sir, so, um, my name is Tahir Abbas. I'm a sociologist. I lived and worked in Istanbul for a period of six years uh, up until uh, nine days before the, the failed coup events of 2016. So I noticed uh, a great deal of change inside the country. And this question about where does Turkey go, what does it represent, uh, how does it see itself as a nation is, is a perennial question that goes back to the founding of the, the modern uh, secular state. And of course the Kurdish question is a big one, but also the, the Alevi question is also big. And then we have to think about minorities. There are no more than 100,000 uh, Jewish and Christian minorities left in Turkey, uh, which is uh, a, a small number from what it was 100 years ago, considerably smaller. And they face all sorts of problems of, of, of belonging and uh, associational life. So inside of Turkey, there are a whole, sort, a whole series of issues. And, and what's important in terms of the, the rise of a the AKP and Erdogan is the, is the sort of the Muslim middle class, which has become the backbone of the, sort of the, the Anatolian economic a miracle that became the, the Turkish success story. And, and they, they expect a certain kind of response on the part of the state. Not, uh, uh, not only are they powerful economic figures, they're also becoming powerful political figures. So there is a sense of the need for a, a majoritarian nationalist perspective on Turkey, which looks out across uh, the Sunni Arab world or the Sunni Muslim world to, re to come back to this idea of a new Ottoman uh, world view where Turkey is at the center, where Turkey can be the, the bridge between civilizations, east and west, and north and south. And, uh, and, and, in, and, and where the rest of the, the Middle East has been on fire ever since the, uh, the, the Arab Spring, Turkey has rem managed to remain intact, but now it is under, under severe pressure. Academics silenced, journalists silenced. There is no independent media, there's no independent voice coming out of Turkey. There are no external views of Turkey which are independent. Uh, and, and so it, it's become a closed and inward-looking society where these old uh, problems keep re-emerging, keep reinventing themselves in the light of well, where does Turkey go? Because nobody is entirely sure, least alone the AKP. While it was booming in, in the late uh, 2000s and while it was the European capital of culture where a lot of foreign reserves came in after the collapse of the Eurozone, it's that, all of that has gone in the opposite direction. So there are problematic issues inside the country will, which will affect how it sees itself and how it sees its relations with its neighbours. One other topic we haven't talked about is the relationship with the EU and, and the refugee migration deal which was a travesty in many respects because it used millions of people as pawns in the game between the EU not being responsible, holding up to the Geneva Conventions, and, and, and Turkey uh, playing power politics with the EU with uh, arguably a weak hand. So lots of issues to think about. Well, uh, of course, uh, I, I ought to have added the EU fissure because uh, not only did Davutoglu's plan of no quarrels with the neighbours 
fall down and lead to a situation of quarrels with basically all the neighbors. Uh, the idea of being a bridge between the European Union and the uh, wider Muslim world has also fallen through. It's a Boris Johnson bridge going uh, nowhere. Uh, so everywhere I look at the, and you know, I was an admirer of uh, Erdogan in his early period. I believed he was the only man who could solve the Kurdish question, who was ready to do so, because he, he was an Islamist. He was not a Turkish nationalist. Uh, and I believed them that they didn't want uh, problems with their neighbors. And their handling of the economy showed that uh, an Islamic government could understand the economy, could be a success uh, economically. And it all went uh, pear-shaped. And there's a lot of dead bodies on the, on the road as a result. Thank you uh, for that contribution. Let's take the young man in the middle. Go ahead, sir. Yes, uh, I was going to say that um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't call this sympathy, okay? I, I choose my words very carefully about uh, what, the, you know, what the Turkish are doing, you know, trying to play both sides, trying to be duplicitous. But I can sort of see why they d would do it and wouldn't put it past any other country in the region to do the same in their position, okay? Not that they're not doing that already. It's certainly, you know, like base, almost all... Uh, parties, all belligerents, they're all double dealing each other, supporting each other, fighting each other, you know, you've got a lattice work of alliances and, you know, uh, c conflicts, of course, because there are just so many, there are so many players in that area, um, with different interests, some of them mutual, some of them overlapping, some of them mutually exclusive, or seemingly, but the point is, Turkey being a, a Eurasian country, a sort of that, that sort of grey area, that, that sort of um, strad straddler, between you know the, the materialistic West and the sl somewhat less materialistic East, it it has felt it has had to almost it, it's felt it's had to protect its interests by appeasing ISIL by giving it some support behind the scenes, while simultaneously also claiming to f claiming to also f uh, f support fighting it. You know by but it's also had to because it because it, it's had a really bad relationship with almost all the Arab states. Okay, even though they ha both have mutual interests of suppressing the, the Cur you know, Kurdish nationalism, the problem is it, it, it's had to be so, in order, in order to defend it itself, and because it's, it's in between a rock and a hard place, it's had, to, it's had to manipulate all sides in order for it to survive, even though its efforts will probably, I would say, might, could just prove self-defeating. Well, survive would be one thing that yeah. would be a strategy for survival. Yeah. The, the issue is that Turkey's attitude is not, to survive, it is to go forward, mm. to penetrate other people's space and to influence and if possible dominate those. But why did Erdogan and his family and his entire cabinet go to Mogadishu? Uh, some people think it was piety. Uh, I rather doubt that. Mm. Um, the uh, situation now is that Erdogan is at war uh, with the Kurds in Turkey with the Kurds in Syria. He's therefore at war with the US, at least tactically. He's at war with, with Saudi Arabia, with the UAE. Uh, his only friend in the Gulf is now uh, Qatar. Um, and uh, so it, it just seems to me a, a catalogue of failed policies. I don't see him as a grand Mephistopheles, a great uh, Bismarckian uh, 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 strategist of foreign policy. I think he's actually going to leave office with all of his plans in ruins. Mm -hmm. oh, I'd say he's in a very vulnerable position because of the pressures that have come from within as a result of their external actions. As we saw in August of 2016, the terrorist attack in October, I think, of 2015 by the PKK rebels. He is, uh, to me, that looks like not, the, not an assertive act of influence in any part of that area it's actually I'd say it's actually not quite an act of desperation but it's a, a sort of a response to a, a, a your vulnerabilities and you know acknowledgement of your vulnerabilities and simultaneously denying it as well by counteracting it mm. you know yeah. very interesting thank yeah. you very much for that the lady in the middle Hello, my name is Rana. Uh, I would say that Erdogan is uh, like a fox. He, uh, before he came as uh, 
very moderate and uh, he wanted to win the mind of uh, all the Muslims mainly by by uh, saying that he support uh, the Palestinian cause because this is the main issue for all the Muslims so we all loved him for for uh, being friendly with everyone by supporting Palestine and he approached Assad and convinced him uh, to open the border when, when they opened the border he uh, you know entered all the terrorists uh, through Turkey and now when uh, Trump uh, said that Jerusalem is the capital of uh, the Zionist state, mm. he threatened to cut the relation with them. Mm. But he didn't cut the relation uh, with the Zionists yet. So I don't know how, how they continue to see him like a leader for... Uh, well, I suppose Muslim. in the land of the blind, the, ma the one-eyed man is the king. And, they, yeah, uh, they turn he's, blind he's eye. He's the only one doing anything. They turn blind eye. But he ended up going in the in the wrong direction when people trusted him. We saw his real face. He went from after. hero to zero. Yes. Yes. Uh, Madam, um, I'm just curious to see how this operation will end, and I would like to also see how he will do in the elections in 2019 without solving all the problems in in inside Turkey with all the breach of human rights and. Who's counting the votes in 2019? <laughs> This is controversial as well, and it has been for quite some time now. Um, I don't like conspiracy theories, but um, there has been doubts um, in how much we can trust in the counting of the votes in the elections, particularly in the last referendum. So it's going to be very interesting. I hope not a lot of people will be hurt um, in Syria, in Turkey. I mean, there has been conflict going on and we just would like to see a solution to this problem that doesn't seem to be coming to an end, especially in the southeastern Turkey. It affects the economy, it affects um, everything, every aspect of people's, people's lives and um, it will be interesting to see 2019 and the road to 2019 and its policies. we're all still around to see it. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so my name is George and I uh, am from Bulgaria. So, uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so, we've been uh, talking about aspects of uh, the politics of Turkey uh, around Asia, but uh, not uh, with uh, border countries like Bulgaria. Mm. So, very recently, uh, our Prime Minister was uh, in Istanbul on an official visit to open a uh, uh, Bulgarian Orthodox Church, and uh, this is the only iron church in the world. It's made of iron two centuries ago, and uh, the Turkish government uh, mm, subsidized the uh, renovation, about five thousand uh, five million dollars. Uh, and uh, again, we have the border of about two hundred kilometers with Turkey, and. Uh, a uh, wall, uh, iron wall was built in order to stop the refugees and there was an agreement then that uh, the, Tur the Turkish government will uh, do its best to stop refugees coming from Turkey into Bulgaria and so on, into Europe. Um, so this is a good point about foreign uh, policy of Erdogan. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, we were five uh, centuries under Turkish occupation, and in Bulgaria, uh, the population is about seven million now, and one seventh, a bit, about seven, uh, seven hundred thousand or one million of these people are Turkish uh, uh, speaking people. I mean, they have remained from uh, the, the period of uh, when uh, uh, it was, we were part of the Ottoman Empire in Bulgaria. Uh, they have their own party, uh, which is the third strongest party, and it's actually uh, there in uh, in Bulgaria. It's, uh, does that party generally support Erdogan? Of course it does. Of course it does, and uh, and it's a very strong party. And uh, in, uh, it's uh, we have the Democrats, the Democratic Party, and uh, we have the, uh, the the Socialist Party, and we have the, the Turkish Party. So any government in Bulgaria ever since changes came mm -hmm. through. It's, uh, oh, it's any government not supported by the Turkish party will, will not, not succeed. succeed. Fascinating, I must say, a yeah. new uh, angle. Uh, Dr. Marcus, final word to you. 
Yeah, I believe there's a lot of misunderstanding and naivety about the nature of Turkey. There's too much romanticist drivel that's being attached to this country. Whether Turkey is governed by an Islamist or a secularist, Turkey will always remain the same old Turkey. Turkey is a threat not just to its neighbours, but to the wider region. As its neighbours can testify, Syria can testify to that, Iraq can testify to that, and as I said earlier on, Cyprus can testify to that. And one bonus here in regard to what's happened in northern Syria is that Russia is the dominant partner in its relationship with Turkey. What happened after the Turks shot down that Russian uh, fighter plane really put the Turks in a serious situation because the Russians placed economic sanctions on Turkey which had a serious effect on the Turkish economy but also as well Russia going back to Soviet times has long-standing ties to the PKK. Look how many members of the Turkish security forces, uh, including the police, died in southeast Turkey after that Russian plane was shot down. I mean, that's no coincidence. And of course, Erdogan, he went to St. Petersburg and apologized to Putin and uh, profusely um, pledged uh, support to the policy. So really, Turkey's role in Syria is short term and it is precarious for a number of reasons. But one of them is that Russia has Turkey where it wants it. But I do believe that people should be very, very cautious in their attitude towards Turkey. It's been marvellous. For me, I hope it was for you. And if it was, come back for the next Kali Mahora. Thank you all for being here.